Thank you guys all for being here, and thank you at home for joining us for more Up North. This is our 20th episode. I never thought I'd say that. I, huh, I'm really excited. Um, great show tonight. Very exciting. We've got Chris Rose from REAP who's gonna be here and talking to us about some of the renewable energy uh, concepts that we have, bigger concepts uh, in Alaska. You know, I heard that we've got some tidal things that we could do, maybe some wind. And then also we have a panel talking about Chewitna Coal. It's only 45 miles away and uh, it's kind of a big hairy deal. They're taking out a salmon stream. I know, there's not even a law against it, who knew? So uh, we'll be talking to them and uh, so you wanna stay tuned. you guys all came down tonight. This is great. Uh, welcome to More Up North. And uh, I'm really excited. I've interviewed this person before on the radio. And I think there's so, there are so many things going on in Alaska right now for renewable energies. And Chris Rose is here. He's the executive director of Renewable Energy Alaska Project, also known as REAP. Welcome. Thanks, Shannon. I'm glad you're here. So it was so weird when you came in to do the radio show with me. I was just like, I forgot we were doing radio because I was so <laughs> interested in like all these solutions because so much of the time we hear about energy problems um, and we, we hear about them all the time and for really good reasons because they're actually problems. And you are working, REAP is working on so many different solutions. And can you talk about some of the problems and how REAP was founded and funded first? Well, sure. I mean, Energy is the lifeblood of any economy, and the reason that REAP was formed is because we have in Alaska some of the best renewable energy resources in the world, but we haven't really been looking at using them. And so what we did six years ago is pull together all the energy stakeholders and said, would you join an education and advocacy group that promoted renewable energy and energy efficiency if we formed it? And we were able to do that. We have utility companies from all over the state. We have environmental groups, consumer groups, Alaska Native uh, groups. Uh, we have businesses. We have state and federal agencies. We now have 71 groups in our coalition. Uh, we started with 16. So we have a lot of folks around the state, uh, literally members from Ketchikan to Kotzebue, all promoting the idea of generating more renewable energy here in the state of Alaska. And clearly we need to do that because we've been relying for so long on the status quo, which has been fossil fuels. And not to say that fossil fuels haven't been a good thing for our economy. Clearly they have built our civilization. They have built our economy here in Alaska. But the problem is there's a lot of risk in continuing to rely on that status quo. The first one is price, because supply and demand are just gonna dictate the price of fossil fuels are gonna go up. We've got an escalating demand for energy on this planet. We've got people in India and China that all want to drive cars. We've got all kinds of folks around the, the United States that are using tons of energy. And meanwhile, the, the fossil fuels we've been relying on for the last 150 years are in decline. So our price of fuel is going to go up, and that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing this in Cook Inlet with natural right. gas, and we're seeing it all over the world with oil. And uh, we're, we're, not <clears throat> we're, we're very vulnerable to, to price increases. For instance, we've had a lot of oil production here in Alaska, but we've never, ever been able to control the price of the oil coming down the TAPS pipeline. It's the same thing if we get a natural gas pipeline. It will be good for jobs, it will be good for economic development, but it may not be the best energy source for us in the long term because it's a world commodity. Well, I think it makes sense that we use the renewables or the alternative energies that don't cost us as much and then just sell what we're extracting. I mean, if we weren't as reliant, and, and I look at different communities around the state who've gone through these really tremendous um, shifts, like you said, with the price. You know, when you look at what happened last year in Western Alaska, it happened to some extent this year between the, the subsistence harvest crash and fuel going through the roof. Uh, people were all living in schools. Right. And, and so when I look at that, I'm like, wow, okay, well, if they had, a totally different grid function if they had you know solar or if they had wind or they had some other power source then 
well, that's more that goes down the pipeline and is right. sold. Well, the biggest advantage of renewable energy is it's flat price because there's no fuel cost. You put in your capital, you put in your plant, and you know what your o and is going to be over the next 20 or 30 years, or in the case of hydro, maybe 100 years. And so you are certain of how much your power is going to cost. So not only does that help your economy, it actually invites investment because people are going to be certain of the cost of doing business. With fossil fuels, you just have no certainty. It's a very volatile market. You right. have no control over that. And in the smaller villages, as you were talking about, this is even a bigger problem because it costs so much to get the fuel out there. And one of the visions that REAP has is that we should become a world leader in renewable energy development. And one of the things that we could be doing right now is developing systems that work in Village Alaska to help those people who live here in the state, but then also being able to export that technology to the rest of the world. Because there are two billion people on the planet with no electricity. And most of them wanted it yesterday. So if we can figure out a way to get them clean energy that we develop here, we can diversify our economy as well. Well, and I spent part of my life growing up with no electricity or running water, other than, you know, run down to the creek and get it. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of people in Alaska that enjoy a rural lifestyle, and that that's really valuable to them, and to put in all of those systems would be really expensive. If there was a way to do that, that they could still have a quality of life and, and, and something they could count on. You know, right. like you're saying, I mean, that, that sweep that we're, we're seeing really affects people with on, on fixed incomes first. That's right. Really hard. So this is an economic development as much as it is anything else for you. Oh, absolutely. This is, we, f we always frame this issue as risk management, and it's an economic issue, the first one being price. But it's also a geopolitical issue. You know, we're reliant on foreign uh, sources of oil and gas. Um, it's a climate change issue, clearly. It's going to cost Alaska a lot of money to deal with the climate change issues that we've got here from, you know, melting permafrost affecting our roads and airports and schools to villages that have to be moved. And the biggest risk that we see is that the rest of the world is already moving this direction. And it's big business, $150 billion a year. It's expected to quadruple in the next decade. And yet the United States and Alaska are behind the curve, which means we'll wind up doing everything that we're talking about anyway, but we'll be buying it from somebody else. So the risk is we're going to get left on the platform and the train will go. And right. so we're trying to get people to understand this is a way to actually develop our economy. And we've brought lots of speakers from around the country and even around the world up to Alaska to show how people are doing it in other places. Well, it seems that you know the whole idea of last frontier, that we could actually be a little bit frontiery, right? Have that frontiery thing working for us, right? And and just you know, make those jumps. I mean, we've got tidal, <coughs> we've got so many different things. Geothermal, my God, you look at, right. at other countries that are completely run on geothermal now. We've got 90% of the country's tidal energy potential, 50% of the country's wave power potential, some of the best wind in the world, some of the best geothermal in the world, biomass, solar, hydro. We've got some of the best resources. What we need is policy, and the state legislature is working on that. We've got tons of money, and right. the state legislature has also been putting money into that. They've put $125 million into the Renewable Energy Grant Fund that we worked to pass two years ago in the last 18 months. And yesterday, the state capital budget came out with another $50 million for the Renewable Energy Grant Fund. So this state is starting to really progress in that direction, but we have to keep moving. So what, how, can, how can people be part of this? Because we can say, well, we, we want our legislature to do something about this. Well, good luck with that. I mean, unless you're going to spend a lot of time online or get on a plane and actually fly to Juneau or really make a lot of phone calls, it's hard to be involved in that process. But how can people do that? I know I grew up with a neighbor who ran his house on wind. He had his own little windmill, and his mm -hmm. old, it was off, off the grid. So I mean, other than like either you know, building some contraption on the side of your house or going to Juno. How can people plug into this whole thing? The first thing is for everyone to be energy efficient and conserve energy. And there's two, there's a difference. Conserving energy is me, means that you might turn down your thermostat and put on a sweater. Not everyone wants to do that. And people get the image of Jimmy Carter in the White House with a sweater on. Yeah. Energy efficiency is different. All you're doing is buying an energy efficient device that makes that change for you. So you don't have to change your own behavior. You get a light motion sensor, for instance, in your house so that the lights go off when you leave the room, or you get an energy efficient car, or you put more insulation in your roof. That is the number one investment we should be making. 
And that's what everyone can do. It's much easier than people putting on their own solar panel or wind turbine. The other thing is to vote in the utility board elections that occur every spring. In fact, they're happening right now. Right. All of our utilities are co-ops. And so we actually have more of an, a chance and opportunity to influence utility policy than almost any state in the country. Only Nebraska is a, power, uh, a public power state like us. And so people overlook those uh, board elections because they don't think they're significant. And yet the utility boards in this state make 50 and 100 year decisions. It's, it's more, it affects you every time you turn on your lights or you're watching your television at home. Thanks so much for coming in. What's the website that people can go to? realaska.org, renewableenergyalaska.org, or you can just Google REAP in Alaska and you'll get to us. Excellent. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. All right. All right. We'll be right, right back with more Up North. <laughs>